I'm Bonnie Urbay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, women and weapons. As the nation divides over gun control once more, the Women's Leadership Forum of the National Rifle Association meets this weekend in Colorado for the group's annual summit. While the National Rifle Association has recruited women for two decades, polls show women are still much more likely than men to support gun control and oppose the NRA's stance. Last December, the Pew Research Center released a poll showing for the first time in two decades, more Americans supported gun rights than gun control. But more than half of women told pollsters they supported gun control, while many fewer wanted to protect the right to own guns. Men split by much larger margins. Another poll taken by YouGov and The Economist this past summer showed 54 percent of women believed that handgun control laws should be stricter compared to 49 percent of men. Meanwhile, the New York Times reported this week, apparently the mother of Oregon shooter Chris Harper Mercer made online references to having a son who had a disorder on the autism spectrum and of the family having strong pro-gun views. Accounts linked to Laurel Harper, his mother, posted, quote, I keep all my mags full. I keep two full mags in my Glock case, and the ARs and AKs all have loaded mags. So, Anishé, is the uh, gun control divide in this country really just a gender divide? I hope so. I, I strongly believe and I hope that at the end of the day, gun control reform is really going to be led by women in this country. There are over 350 million guns. I think that, uh, Bonnie, that for the most part, it's going to take a long, long road for change to happen. It should happen faster, but I'm afraid we need more pressure from many sources. It is a gender divide, but let me just say that many things are in our politics. And in fact, uh, women are also shown to be more risk adverse than our men. And so it doesn't surprise me that we see women leaning more toward the liberal position uh, and men toward the conservative one. Well, when it comes to gun control, I just hope that we can present a solution that would actually do something about the problem. Nothing that's being presented these days would actually have stopped any of these problems. What about what uh, President Obama suggested late in the week when he met with the families of the victims in Oregon? And he's talking about uh, executive action to require background checks in all situations. Of course, they're not done at gun sales, at uh, gun shows. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Uh, there is no gun show loophole. There is no law that exempts gun shows from actually present from doing background checks. You're still supposed to. The only time that there isn't a background check required is between individuals, uh, private individuals within a state border. Every other time a background check is required. But there also is a very clear pattern. I mean, most mass shooters tend to be white white males. And I also think something that's very interesting is that, you know, we regulate uteruses and vaginas more in this country than we do guns. So I think if we need to talk about gun control, why don't we regulate guns the way we do abortions, which is what, 72-hour waiting period? Guns, you know, that a ultrasound. week or two waiting period. You can't just walk into a gun but shop. But people are doing it. Buy. No, they're not. You can't just walk into you a gun shop. You don't think there's an issue of how easy it is to get guns in it this country? It is not easy to get a gun in this country. Then you well, have to I'm have not, a waiting but period. My understanding you have to pay money. You have to have a oh, background wait, wait, wait check. Wait a second. My understanding of gun laws is very different from your understanding. Right, of because gun the laws. media portrays I, I, them wrong. Well, but but I have actually been to a gun show. It was a couple of years ago, and there was nobody doing background checks. It was you 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 walked up to the counter, you paid your money, and you got a gun. All kinds of guns, including automatic weapons, military style weapons. No, you you have to have a background check. That's what is happening at gun shows. If there was, and possibly this if it's person a private sale at a gun show between you, two individuals, and you're not at a licensed dealer at a gun show. Okay, but that's most of gun shows. No, they're licensed dealers. Well, I mean, let me just say that in these cases that we have seen, you know, um, certainly in Sandy Hook as well as this case in Oregon, um, I don't think the background checks, however good they may be or may not be, um, would have actually prevented this situation. I mean, I do think we have to realize that these mothers did sort of support their sons Very much so. to have guns, to be a part of a gun culture. And, and actually, fact, the Oregon shooter's dad was, is opposed to guns, and his mother is a 
you know, what a there lot of people more, would refer right, to as an extremist pressure. in that she has all these weapons. But, but there has she would have passed background checks. Right. I mean, both these mothers in both of these situations likely would have made it through the background checks. This is not a, the kids. This not is, the kids. This so is a role for we community. We have a this bigger This is a role for community. The reality is, is that I've worked with many uh, mentally uh, damaged children, and, and their, their ailments become very apparent in a teenager and beyond. The community has to be a little more engaged in watching out for these type of situations. But you need some common yeah. sense. If you're going to be a gun collector, keep them out of reach of your kids. I mean, a couple of days ago, a, a nine-year-old boy shot a little girl over like a lollipop, or, or I think they were siblings. Killed, yeah, and just crazy. killed her. And killed her. So, I mean, if you're going to be into gun collecting, make sure your toddlers can't, can't reach for them. But, well, no, you know, in, in that situation, in a situation where a mother procures a, a, a weapon legally for and gives it, by the way, the Oregon shooter had some guns in his arsenal that belonged to his mother. Um, you know, there's no law that's going to prevent that, there's right? No, it has to be community. I think it has to be, there has to be also more, I think. Well, community, uh, but come on, there's community now. But, uh, right, and at the I mean, time, I, I actually started, wonder. Do you, do you know, drunk, think, driving, drunk driving started with community pressuring. It eventually led to laws, but there was actually community pressuring, saying you have to watch what you do. If you're drinking and driving, it's going to lead to death. Already laws against murder. I mean, this kid, uh, he might have been on the autistic spectrum but what are we going to say everyone who's autistic is now like unable to do m like anything you know get guns think it's kind like of that. racist how whenever it's a white shooter it's about your mental health but if this guy was Arab or Muslim or brown it would be a terrorism act well, well he actually well, biracial. Was biracial. biracial his right. mother's and African American his father's white so uh, in that situation I mean and w the Virginia shooter was black and I think it it all still came down to uh, you know access to guns by mentally ill but, people. But, but I have to ask you, do we really believe that a law banning the, uh, background checks for uh, mental, you know, banning uh, mental, uh, and I, I do believe if you've ever seen a psychiatrist, you're not allowed to buy a gun. And if you're honest about it on uh, when you when you do a background check. But is I, that, I, I that would say that that's a, impact? But, that's, but let me just say that's a, that would be a, a, also a horrible problem because, quite frankly, we want people who have mental health issues to go seek care. So we don't want to put another barrier in their way to say, oh, I better not do that because if I do have an interest in this and if there isn't a problem with it, um, then, you know, you don't want people to not get help. I mean, on the larger issue, though, Obviously, we need more common sense reform on a lot of these things. I mean, quite frankly, but what's gonna, one, what in your no, mind, what in your mind would work? Well, I look. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, Anna Shea brought up, you know, the abortion debate, and we're talking about the NRA. I would argue that both of those organizations end up and in a world where every common sense reform is a slippery slope, and they assume that it means that there won't be access to abortions or there won't be access to guns. I think. Both of those positions are extremist and really unhelpful to society. I'm curious why, um, like you mentioned, community support grew into the anti drunk, and drunk drive, driving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember Mothers Against Dr Drunk Driving, yeah. which right. started yep. in the 70s right. or 80s. Right. Why isn't there a Mothers Against right. Gun Gun there violence. Is. There, is. there is. I actually follow them on Facebook and they're oh, great. Right. <laughs> okay, good. But, but I also think, I mean, uh, more than that, I think that the NRA lobby, I mean, we are becoming desensitized. You would think that there would be so much gun control and legislation after Sandy Hook. Look where we are today. There was a shooting last week. There's probably going to be one next week. I mean, Well, there have been endless. two, at least as of the 274th day of this year, which was a week or two ago, there were 294 yeah. mass Shooting. And did you see the but chart that Obama asked journalists to do about deaths for Americans uh, on terrorism uh, as, as opposed to gun control? I think the difference was it was like 310 deaths to terrorism and 350,000 deaths for and gun control. And yet at the control. same time, gun violence is at a historic low and has been down since No, actually, murders are way yeah. up. Murders. murders are what gun related murders are way up but this is it, also about our society it's not just about the guns i mean i think one of the things that is real is we are still dealing with you know economic problems in this country there are many people out of work there are so many ways in which our society right now is distressed 
And I think guns are the answer of to course. some. To, to your point, uh, that relates too, to no, mental we health. Can't, we, we're out of time on this, but thank you very much. <laughs> Let us know what you think. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie or Bay. From the gun debate to crying in the Shark Tank. Investors on the reality TV show Shark Tank are known for their candor with the entrepreneur contestants seeking funding and partnerships. But this week, the show entered the debate about working women. That, when one of the star financiers, Barbara Corcoran, chastised a female contestant for crying in front of the panel. Mickey Bay became emotional when she did not secure a deal for her company. Corcoran told her she was giving away her power as a woman when she cried publicly. Bay disagreed writing online about differences in how men and women are perceived at work. Reaction to Bay Online has been generally positive, but critics say it isn't about gender, it's about acting as a professional, and tears belong outside the office. So, Ash, uh, is, is there any context within which it's okay, uh, from your perspective, for people to cry, women to cry? in the office? I think if you learn of a death in the family, possibly, but it's right. I mean, it is about being professional in the workplace, and crying doesn't really suit her. I think she was fine. She was on a reality TV show. Men have cried on that show as well, so, you know, but again, professionalism. Well, is there a double standard, though, if, where the men criticize the way she's been criticized? Not that I saw, so that does appear to be a double standard. And Your certainly, thoughts? I mean, certainly we've seen Speaker Boehner cry. We've seen, um, you know, former Secretary <laughs> But he State, gets ribbed uh, for it, too. Absolutely. He gets not. Although, uh, when Ronald Reagan cried after the Challenger disaster, um, he did not get yeah. uh, ribbed for it. I mean, I do think people have to be allowed to show a full range of emotion. I think this idea that professionalism means you're an ice queen um, is not appropriate either. And I would argue that this is really about context. You don't want to have... A, a, like a reputation as being a crier or a yeller or anything overly, overly emotional. emotional but at the same time there are situations where um, you know sort of emotions are appropriate. Tears are for tragedy. I think in the workplace one should accept assuming they're a professional whatever position that you're going to be challenged you're going to have disappointments and you're going to have successes and and in the midst of disappointments I think you're supposed to be able to hold your cool go outside and cry come back into the workplace. I think it depends you know I worked for a really long time at a women's nonprofit and we would deal with sex trafficking and domestic violence and comfort women testimonies and whatnot so I think that at, sometimes it's okay to cry at work, but this is a very specific case. I mean, Shark Tank is about the business world, and it was funny because my husband is a big fan of the show, and we were actually debating this, and for the first time I really agreed with him because he was like, male or female in business, you start crying, you really give up your power. Uh -huh. I'll bet Barbara uh, it got a little more attention because it was a woman criticizing another woman for crying, and you don't see that yeah. that often. But I watched that episode, and to be fair, um, the eyelash extension lady, she wasn't answering the judge's questions. She, they kind of started like cross-examining her, and she was just like, "Wow!" So it's like, okay, you were clearly emotionally unstable. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was uh, just, it was a ploy in a sense, almost. Well, I felt like she really overreacted. But do we, <laughs> is there a double standard? Is it worse for women if they cry in, yeah. the, in the office? I, I think yeah. it is, although let me just share with you. If, 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 if a male boss... But are boss, men also if way they, less likely to cry? They are less in general, likely, general, no question. pressure telling them not to ever cry right. or show yeah. emotion. And I think if a, male, if a male boss cries in the office, it's probably more unnerving to the staff than critical, critically viewed. Right, I mean, I... I I've cried in the office before. I try to keep it to a minimum, but sometimes something has happened, and luckily I've always been working with men who have been like, okay, this is fine. Let's, we'll get it together and come back, you know, or take a walk or something. So if you don't have that, that might be a problem. But again, if I saw one of my male bosses crying, then I'd kind of be like, dude, <laughs> come on, man. So up. Come no, be a man. No, 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 more of a double standard, but in the other in direction. The other way, right? But she writes, the woman who cried, that being too feminine isn't considered professional, yet behaving aggressively and confidently as a female is equally frowned upon. Is that true, too? 
I mean, it could be. It depends on how aggressive you're acting. If you if you are aggressive to the point of being overbearing, then a man's going to be called a jerk. A woman's going to be called something else, right? But, but it's, women it's an really aggressive have, thing. Have it hard because it's like either you're too. It, it's just this whole stereotype that we're too emotional. Remember, everyone was like Hillary Clinton. She ha she's so cold. She has no emotions. Then she started crying when she was like campaigning the last time. Everyone's like she's an emotional mess. And it's like, <laughs> what do you want? Yeah. Well, what, well, what do people want, and what is appropriate? But I don't think we should associate not crying with being powerful. I mean, uh, uh, quite frankly, um, power, when you get into it, is, is about many more things, um, which include, in fact, being vulnerable and showing your strength through that vulnerability. So, you know, there are times when it's incredibly powerful, in fact, to have a reaction that no one would expect you to have. That oftentimes can work in your favor in ways that being sort of predictable and cold may not. Is it, uh, now I wonder also in this show, by the way, I mean the producer's uh, former panelist of ours was a, was a panelist on, on Martha Stewart's The, uh, oh, the, the Apprentice, Apprentice. Yeah, the and she was told by the producers, you don't get in enough fights, you're going to be tossed off the show right, yeah. if you don't start fighting with people, you're too nice. So maybe Bay was told, you know, show some emotion and cry. And I just wonder if, you really have parents, to watch, if parents have to, if parents should be prepping kids, not, you know, not about the shark tank and not about the show, but just in general, should they be prepping kids, especially girls, do not cry you know when you're in an office situation just what you said which Stay was focused. quite frankly Stay one time the one time in my life when I was fired exactly what I did I ran I held my tears and I ran Run downstairs out. and found a, you know went into a restaurant bathroom and cried I'm quoting Sa uh, 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 San uh, Cheryl Sandberg and other women leaders that say look when you're a leader when you're in a powerful position show your emotion outside come back and deal with the challenges by thinking through don't get off put by a disappointment in the office. Tragedy is a different situation because tragedy, everyone can gravitate towards the, the sadness that emerges. But when you're talking about a business disappointment, I think that was Barbara Corcoran's point. Yeah. And I think, that, I think that whether you're male or female, women should take, take heed. Silence is sometimes much more powerful than anything else, right. words or tears. Exactly. Behind the headlines, the Golden Girls Network, as the baby boomers hit retirement age, many people want to create new retirement living situations, particularly unmarried or widowed women who don't want to live alone. The Golden Girls Network promotes shared living for economic as well as personal reasons. You think that's annoying? She came into my room last night when I was reenacting the gangplank scene from Peter Pan. <laughs> what the hell goes on at night in this house? The Golden Girls isn't just a sitcom anymore. It's also the inspiration for the Golden Girls Network, which helps middle-aged people, mainly women, find roommates their own age. According to Bonnie Moore, who founded the network, that kind of living arrangement is becoming more popular. About one in every three boomers is unmarried, and single boomers are mainly women. Women find themselves single when they weren't expecting to be. They don't have the income to support themselves in their retirement, and women tend to be more social, and they gravitate towards living together. Um, we do have men uh, registered with Golden Girls Network, and, and we have no problem with men and women setting up a household together. It just seems to resonate more with women. Moore lives in a Golden Girls arrangement herself, along with five roommates. She helps women interested in joining a Golden Girls home and teaches classes on managing those homes. Now there's a book. I just started taking my experiences and what I knew about being a landlord and putting them together so that I would have material each week for my class. And I pulled all that together and wrote a book. Most women who join the network are single and many are living on fixed incomes. What tends to happen is you cut your housing costs in half. I've had several women who've moved in with me who have been living in apartments and they were paying sixteen hundred, seventeen hundred dollars a month. They moved in here and paid seven hundred, eight hundred. And so right there, it's a major improvement, especially when you're living on a fixed income. But savings isn't the only reason why women join a Golden Girls home. The other aspect is the companionship. 
you're not coming home to an empty house. You walk in the door and somebody says, hi, how was your day? And you have someone to chat with over a cup of coffee or you just know what's going on with somebody's lives and you can talk about it. And that's an important social aspect of, of aging is to have companionship. I like this situation because it saves money and there are people, you know, sometimes you don't want to be alone, there are people to talk to. Um, but I like the freedom. The only thing I worry about is paying that one bill and I can go and come and do what I want. Amina Ross is one of Moore's five housemates. We're all mature women. You know, everyone has something else going on in their lives. And, um, you know, we, we share and interchange that. And I like being able to just chit chat sometimes when I'm cooking or discussing what somebody else is doing. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, 70% of people over the age of 65 will need some form of long-term care. Golden Girls Homes provide an alternative source of care for those who prefer to stay in their own homes. We're still very alive and very vibrant, and I've got another 20 years to go. I'm not, I don't, I don't want to just shuffle off someplace and, and be forgotten. I want to be part of, of this community. I, I really like this town that I live in, and, and I enjoy my house and I enjoy the community and I want to stay here. So is it more of an economic help or more of an emotional help uh, that, that drives women to join these homes or both? Well, I imagine it's both and I think it's fantastic. The reality is that boomer women um, are in every sort of way not like their parents, right? I think when you look at all of the advertising that's, you know, for people who are getting to be boomers, they all want to be, you know, on surfboards and trekking across, um, you know, terrain. And they are much more active and much more engaged than I think their parents' generation. And what this really does is afford them an ability to stay in their communities, be engaged with their communities, and have more friends. I think it's great. I think it's great. First of all, I love the Golden Girls and just the branding itself is like, I want to go live in one of those homes. <laughs> but you know, when I first moved here from Bangladesh so long ago, um, I was shocked at the elderly care system in America. I'm like, how can you not take your parents in? Of course, now living here for no, well most over a American decade. kids don't want to. I, I mean, it yeah. doesn't matter. You know, well, I know. Also, it's just not feasible. Everyone's working. You don't have the care. So I understand it. But when I well, first even, got here, you know, I, I I have to point out that Eleanor Roosevelt when she retired in New York City, moved into a, a doctor's townhouse. She had, what, six kids? Four or six <laughs> children. Um, and, and they didn't want her, and she, or she didn't want to be That's with them. That's such an interesting point, because the, the disintegration of the extended family living together that's taken place over the last 70 years may indeed be constructed into the friendship network yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. And there's so few issues that have mostly positives and, and very few negatives. It's here. kind of like when you're in college, you know, and your girlfriend's kind of taking the role of, of your family. Okay. But you know, when I was growing up, my dad's mom lived with us for 10 years, and then she passed, and my mom's mom lived with us. So for me, I'm just like, oh, um, I always tell my mom. And like, what you was have it like having her in the house? It was great. It was so great. I don't was know it what great? it was like for my parents. Right, I was going to say. <laughs> no, they were both very supportive because just back home, you just, that's not an option. We don't even have elderly care homes. I mean, someone has got to take their parents in. But isn't there also an element here that uh, women need to, uh, I mean, more than men because they tend to retire on less, th way less than men on average. Don't they need more financial education? Be so they don't get to retirement age and, and live on a fixed income that's not enough to support them. Right, I mean, if we're, it's not even going to be an issue just for women coming up. I mean, we're seeing studies now that say people my age are, are just thinking that they're gonna be fine years from now or that Medicaid or, or Social Security is going to take care of them and it's just not going to be there at that point. So, I mean, it's financial education for everyone. I mean, women now as well, if you're about to be 40, 50, you just really get an idea of this, but you need to start when we're young. I mean, more women getting bachelor's degrees, I mean, more women working, I mean, we, we got to be prepared. But you raise a good point, Bonnie, because the average savings for retirement in this country for people over 50 barely totals 100000 mm -hmm. So if the age expectation is going to yeah. be 86 yeah. or Absolutely. older, the retirement savings issue is critical. These could be one of the first steps that start to address that issue. But I remember, you know, as you talked about women being more risk averse, women are less likely they're more likely to spend money on their kids than men, and they're less likely to save it for retirement. That's right. 
So um, anyway, that's it for this edition. <laughs> Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week.